great to see everybody here. And every forum we have, we have more and more participants, which is a great thing for the community and for the campus. So officially, good morning. Uh, my name is Dr. Minji Parker. I'm a professor of criminal justice here at Indiana University East, and I'll be your moderator today. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the Indiana University East Legislative Forum, our, our last forum for this year. We're honored to have our two legislators with us, Representative Brad Barrett and Senator Jeff Rotz. They've agreed to come and spend some time with us today. I'd also like to take an opportunity to recognize some of our campus administrators. We have Dean Jerry Wild from the School of Education is here with us. We have uh, Ray Buchholz, the Director of Gift Development is with us. And we also have Ken Chrisman, our Vice Chancellor for External Affairs is with us today. Um, most notably, um, last but certainly not least, we have our Chancellor with us, um, Dr. Dennis Rome, and he'd like to come and give a few words of welcome. So, Chancellor Rome. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Thanks for, thank you for coming out. We're, we're very honored to have our um, state um, legislators here. I think this is um, it's an important event because here's an opportunity for our representatives to um, discuss with us various issues, uh, issues, especially those that are related in higher education. How many people are here from K-12 today? Surprising. Um, usually we have a couple, a couple front yeah. rows. And so what I would like to happen today is a kind of discussion, especially given um, the fact that there have been some recent um, legislation around higher education. So here's an opportunity for us to talk about that and the um, implications and, and so on. So I'm looking forward to a very um, good um, discussion. And again, it's an honor and pleasure to have our um, honorable guest here with us. Thank you for coming out um, this morning. It's a privilege and honor to serve this wonderful institution. I want you to always feel welcome when you come. And um, I'm not going to take any more time because I'm just excited as you are to um, have this um, dialogue this morning. So thank you for coming out, and let's have a really good discussion. Thank you, sir. OK, so we're going to follow our normal procedures that we um, use all the time. We're going to give our representatives an opportunity to introduce themselves and to tell you a little bit about what's happening in the state legislature. Then we'll open this up for questions from the floor. Each person will have two minutes to ask their question. And I would ask that you introduce yourselves prior to asking your question so that we can start to get to know each other a little bit better as a community and as a campus. And so <clears throat> I'll moderate your time and I'll give you some hints on how much time you have left. And you know, once we get all out of time, I may give you the angry look like, mm, but it's, it won't be that bad, okay? But so uh, everybody will have two minutes to ask your question. I do ask that you only ask one question at a time so we can give an opportunity to every, for everyone to ask questions. And, and if we get through everyone's question, we'll go back around, okay? So at this time, I'd like to uh, introduce our two guests, and I'll let them introduce themselves and... The, the mayor, I'm sorry, to recognize the mayor. Oh, yes, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, the mayor is with us. Um, uh, um, I'm sorry, it, it, we were recognizing okay. our, uh, our uh, dignitaries in. I, I didn't see you come in. I, I apologize. So we're glad that you could come out and be with us today. So thank you for coming out to be with us. And um, feel free to ask questions as well. We'd love to have you uh, ask some questions of our representatives as well. So uh, let me start with, I think last time we started with Representative Barrett. So let me start with uh, Senator Rotz this time, and we'll go in that order. <clears throat> well, thank you for the introduction, and thank you for IU and Chancellor and, and uh, Ken, where's he at? Somewhere than, there he is sitting right in front. Uh, pleasure to meet him this morning, the new guy on the block for uh, uh, relations, external relations, I believe. And so uh, we've always had a good relationship with those in the past. Uh, so uh, this year was a, a short session. We started uh, first week of January and we ended uh, uh, the first week and actually March 8th. And so it was an incredible push 
uh, at the end to get done with what we needed to get done. But we got it done. When I say what we needed to get done, essentially the bills that made it through committee and made it through both sides of the building and, and got across the finish line. So um, fairly uh, bipartisan. I think we're in the 85 to 90 percentile reign of bipartisanship and, and the bills in right around the 50, above the 50 percent on 100 uh, percent participation on both sides of the aisle. So uh, there, while there is, uh, you know, some uh, uh, differences, certainly uh, we had a lot of agreement to continue to move forward. So I guess a couple of things, because I, I uh, chair the Education Committee in K-12, I spent a lot of time on reading skills and we kind of, I would say, finished that piece. Uh, maybe we'll hear from Jerry uh, before it's over with on, on some of those things from the higher ed uh, teacher prep uh, pieces of the puzzle. Uh, double down on making sure that one, we're teaching uh, phonics or the science of reading and uh, uh, as well uh, the remediation for that as well as making sure that uh, teachers that are in the field that they have the the ability to gain the professional development to move on to, to be able to get that done um, one of the senate bill one this year was uh, there was a lot of controversy around retention in third grade and uh, uh, we did tighten down some on the retention in third grade if you couldn't pass the third grade reading test that you would you would be held back uh, and, and I stood behind that I you know, if, if we're going to, for several reasons, I think from a very basic principle, if you're going to hold a child back, the earlier you do it, the better, uh, and so that they have the ability to continue to move on. Uh, when we look at some of the reading skills of students, uh, we are suffering some, not just in Indiana, but across the United States, but comparing ourselves to uh, other states is not wise either. We have an obligation to make sure that uh, students can read with every potential tool in the box we can utilize to make sure that that happens and so I think we balanced that thing out in my opinion or I believe we did not think I believe we did to make sure that a minimal amount of students would be held back uh, but continue to move forward uh, there are some school districts like in Western Wayne uh, they had a situation where students could uh, prove that maybe they were two-thirds of the way there but not able to pass the test they had, and I, I'm not even certain that they still do it because the superintendent left, but they would promote kids to the fourth grade and then they would matriculate back to third grade when they teach reading during the daytime. Maybe they were proficient in math and other subjects, but, but would matriculate back and make sure they got what they needed to move forward. So we set a lot of things in place to make sure that the mandate that in second grade they take the test just to get, get an idea where they stand. And if, if a student passes in that, they're done. They move forward and they never have to take the test again. Uh, and then a couple times more in third grade uh, in, so that we know exactly where they're at and help them to move forward. So I, I think we got that thing in a good place. Uh, one other piece of legislation I'll mention on the reading piece, uh, I authored Senate Bill 6, and I original version of that bill charged the department of somehow figuring out where students were at uh, when they get past third grade, if they've passed uh, maybe due to COVID and, and weren't at proficiency in reading, if they're in s somewhere between four and eight, what, what grade level are they reading at? And we discovered in the, the standardized tests that we're able to determine Lexile scores for every student, which, which essentially means we, we, we're able to tell when they take the standardized test once a year uh, that we are able to determine what grade level they're reading at. And, and then so we charge the department with creating a program to go back and, and remediate those students so that uh, they're able to continue to move forward in their education. Um, we know, I, I think we can all agree that reading is fundamental to everything we do, and if a student is, doesn't have the ability to read, they're, they're in trouble. Uh, so, and then the only other thing is we spent a great deal of time last summer on a, a drainage task force. Uh, I see Steve Sloniker here this morning, so from the farming perspective, uh, we, we worked with the Department of Natural Resources extensively during that and then even during session this year uh, trying to come up with some common sense uh, revisions to drainage laws and uh, the as well as setting the stage for floodplain issues that we had right here in Wayne County as well and across the state and uh, I think we landed in a good spot. We, we kept up the battle and, and uh, in a place where DNR is comfortable and we were comfortable with what we ended up with. And so I think with that, that's a, a good beginning. Thanks. Representative Baird. 
Well, thank you. Uh, good morning uh, to everyone as well. And uh, so my, my world has evolved to primarily revolve around uh, healthcare uh, at the state level uh, with the experience that I had as a, a practicing physician here for 25 years. And I tell you that the, probably the number one thing that we've worked on the last really four or five years has been the cost of healthcare. And you know, I can look out the window here and see our Reed Hospital and and how it uh, is so important in this community. And uh, and we're we're fighting the balance between. Um, there are some national studies that show that the cost of providing health care in Indiana is higher than than adjacent states. And it's extremely detailed information. We've gone through a third or fourth generation uh, of data that's come in. And yet every situation that we deal with is different. You know, the, the IU Health in the Indianapolis metropolitan area is certainly a different uh, hospital structure than what we have here in Richmond or up certainly in Randolph County. And so uh, a lot of the stuff we're trying to do is uh, trans in the transparency um, um, arena and um, I was reading the Wall Street Journal yesterday and it's talking about how private equity is getting involved in healthcare in some other states and it's, ca it's caused some monopolies that are not sustainable. They don't have the same commitment to community benefit that a facility such as Reed has. And so we're really trying to uh, work in that space to lower the cost of, uh, lower the cost of healthcare. Uh, one of the uh, Another issue that I've worked on here for several years is the the idea that if you are uh, if you're out in the community and you are sick and you need an ambulance, then um, there has been a real problem in what that ambulance charges to the individual. Insurance companies were not including ambulances in their networks anymore. There's no responsibility for that. The federal government's had difficulty in solving the the network in the ambulance space. And so I've been working on this uh, issue for, this is the fourth year and we finally got it across the finish line where uh, ambulance providers are now made whole and, uh, and the individual, the covered lie will no longer get a surprise bill from an ambulance company. And uh, super excited to have worked that through the system for the last four years. Uh, some of the other stuff that I was involved in is the uh, healthcare workforce. It, it goes back to EMS and ambulance providers. Uh, we're seeing, we're seeing uh, a, a huge workforce issue there. It goes up through our uh, healthcare providers, our nursing um, providers. Uh, a couple years ago, we had an agenda bill that dealt with the nursing workforce, and we made changes that impact uh, IU East and Ivy Tech and our own hospital. And uh, we made some sweeping changes two or three years ago. And then what we did this year was circled back and found those loopholes that still exist and worked on removing those, all with an effort to improve that, that nursing workforce, particularly after COVID where we saw a significant uh, resignation from that workforce, significant amount of stress. That I think we're still seeing the, uh, the impacts from that. Uh, did some... Uh, as Jeff mentioned, uh, we, we did the, uh, the work on um, uh, agriculture and drains and farmland and, and such. Uh, we did something to help our local uh, government um, through the, I think it was the county treasurers that had the issue with the property tax collection. Yeah. So the county treasurers came to us with an issue that it was more expensive to actually collect property tax on mobile homes uh, than it was, uh, it was the more expense than benefit if uh, uh, in that space. And so they asked us to formulate legislation that would give counties the option to opt out of that property tax collection in that space. It requires public meetings. It also gives the opportunity to uh, the county to reverse that if uh, they see fit. And uh, so it's issues like that and the agriculture issue that I that I enjoy because uh, I know that it's it's uh, having an impact on our local communities and it's something that's not healthcare, which nice to get a little break from. So um, those were some of the uh, major issues uh, issues that I helped to champion through the last session. Okay, thank you. 
So now we'll open up for questions from the audience. And um, if you have a question, please just raise your hand. We'll have a microphone brought to you. Again, we ask that you introduce yourself so that we can begin to get to know each other a little bit better. And uh, don't be shy. Just raise your hand, and we'll get started. Everyone has two minutes, and I'll keep time for you, and we'll go from there. So do we have any questions? Ron, uh, Your Honor. Please, I'm on work clothes today. Um, I know this was a short session and you do some good things, but you can't do a lot of things. But one of the things that always interests me is what surprised you this sort of short session. What things came up that you weren't aware of that surprised you and maybe even excited you a little bit. Well, um, well I'm trying to think of something specifically. Um, it's unbelievable the surprises that we get in a session because you're almost working in your own little pod in reality and through the course of the summer you know we're certainly um, dealing in our own communities and then we take part in some of these uh, uh, task forces and also some interim study committees so you're operating within your own little bubble and then when you show up there on that first day and you know 200 bills drop uh, there's no way in, in the world you can anticipate what's, you know, what's coming at you from that matter. So here, even as chair of the health committee, uh, you know, I, I think I got 60 bills assigned to my committee in a short session, which amazes me. Uh, and that of those, probably only, uh, maybe 25% of those was I involved in, in the formulation of. So there was a lot of stuff that others had been working on that then when it just when session starts it uh it drops and you are just floored with this uh ability to to handle this kind of volume of information then get up to speed on it so i think that's probably the biggest thing for me is that the the that there's in our side a hundred of us all all working for the same cause but then it, uh, we frequently don't get unified until we show up there and uh, on the first day so uh, as Brad mentioned, so I, uh, as chair of the education committee, I, pr I probably had uh, I, 60 bills plus as well that came to the committee and we actually heard, uh, and I got in trouble for it, uh, for, for getting 12 or so across the finish line. And so there, as you mentioned, there's a divergent of ideas that come to the table, some for good reasons, some for personal reasons. And, but you only have so much time, and so you, it, it actually makes it uh, fairly simple to eliminate uh, a lot of bills. And I don't particularly some of the some of the stuff as a chair, you have uh, the capacity to say no, 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 yes, and that's it, or you can involve your committee members. And so I routinely do that, uh, involve them in the decision making process when we get down to it, so we know exactly what we're going to hear and what we're not going to hear. Uh, and so the uh, same as Brad, I, I, I'm familiar with the ones I'm thinking about or have created and then a, a few of the other ones that I've been involved in and then and then the rest of them you have no idea they're coming some are some are good and some are, some aren't so good so um, but uh, you know it, it is amazing this the subject matters that come up uh, and uh, uh, some I would never ever think of some are great and some they're they are what they are so I think you know for for us to, to make sure that we look at this community or our our districts, uh, just like the drainage task force, we have a lot of participation from Wayne County in that uh, piece, and so uh, uh, they participated all the way throughout the summer and the fall. And as Brad mentioned, the the uh, mobile home tax that was started right here in Wayne County, uh, and we were able to get across the finish line. So, okay, thank you. Next question, right here. Good morning, I'm Electa Berg, and I'm gonna ask about the Indiana response to the tornado in Winchester, which is kinda uh, close to me because I'm from Winchester. So this EF3 went from Selma to Winchester to Ohio. 47 structures destroyed, 116 damaged or severely damaged. We had our photo op, help came from the american red cross wayne county community food bank helped 
uh, magic chefs from out of uh, the state. The church is rebuilding itself. There is no FEMA help. We're not damaged enough, which irritates me. I like to know why we are not damaged enough. What is the state going to do? And now Holcomb just declared a disaster. DeWine declared their disaster within two days, so good for him. The stories are coming out about how the community is helping itself. And one family came from Ohio that had been helped by people in Winchester, and their son said, I'm coming over here because you helped me. Now, what kind of response are we going to do for this community so that they can rebuild and get going? My last thing, Wapakoneta, Selma High School, 2A, championship game, root for them. They're going to win. <laughs> Basketball is our heart. That's uh, I, ju I just read about Wapakoneta. In fact, he probably got an email too about being able to attend, and so I'm checking the calendar to see if I can I can participate to watch him go, which is incredible, by the way. Uh, so first of all, the FEMA thing that's a whole separate that's a federal issue in a in a conversation uh, between them and and the, the state officials, the governor's office. Uh, one thing I can tell you that, that we did, and, and the governor uh, mentioned this in his initial address up there, that uh, there was a piece of legislation this year that actually made it much easier and, and to, to uh, the process to get emergency funds done very quickly. And uh, actually, the, the governor mentioned that uh, he was, uh, it would have been better if we would have declared an emergency for that act because it would have went into uh, law immediately upon signature, but it went through the normal process, won't be come law until July 1st. So that, that would have helped out uh, and the immediate need. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, I, I went up there Friday morning because it, it was my district <clears throat> before redistricting, and so I, I have some good ties up there and, and really enjoy Randolph County. Uh, uh, I was astounded uh, 12 hours later that all the, in the parking lot for the uh, fairgrounds, there were all the uh, electrical trucks and all the uh, Asplin, some of those organizations that cut trees and things like that were already lined up and across the street in the county garage uh, parking lot, there were at least a dozen dump trucks set up waiting to go. And so I, I was uh, incredibly impressed and did with some friends, looked around uh, through the whole place and um, saw places where something I've never seen before, where there were cars and trucks headed towards Ohio, actually, where they were just thrown out in the middle of a field. And so it was incredible that no one was, there were no fatalities. In fact, I, I call it a miracle, honestly, looking at the devastation. Uh, so uh, uh, I can't speak for the governor. Uh, why it took a couple days to go through the process to get to the other side. He did have his staff with him, which I, I'd never seen uh, that happen before, his internal staff, chief of staff. Uh, and so um, uh, I, I'm, I'm proud of what's happening up there with the citizenry. And uh, uh, can the state do a better job? Yes, ma'am. We do have some language in place. Just wasn't quick enough. <clears throat> so I'm proud to say that. Um, yeah, so I'd been speaking to the state rep from that area, uh, J.D. Prescott, and, and what he told me on the FEMA response is that it's extremely important to get an accurate estimate of damage. And, and so it's one of these issues that they've learned from other episodes in the past that the quick response is not always the best response when it comes to FEMA. So it's in their best interest to assess this drone information that they're getting over over um, uh, sky sky level views of this. Get information from all those people that had loss, uh, and then come up with the most accurate estimate because that's when. Uh, FEMA can be the most help. So my understanding is that the delay in the federal relief is due on trying to get estimates at the most accurate level possible. So I know from the uh, I know from just Jeff and I were both in Union County driving back on 70, and we saw the storm developing and saw the sky lit up. And the minute I got within five miles of Richmond. Uh, started seeing all of the emergency response. So we know the citizenry has responded. We know local governments, units of government have responded. The state was up there that morning. I've also spoken to uh, Department of Homeland Security. You know, one, some of the issues that we deal with, uh, 
you know, one of the issues I've worked on for a couple of years is this whole 911 system and having 911 intercommunication and the ability for counties that are adjacent to each other to communicate. And, and actually, when we're on, on a border of another state, to have communication across those state lines as well. So sometimes an, uh, an episode like this gives you ability to do a root cause analysis and look at how those mechanisms are in place. And whereas things aren't always perfect, it gives you an opportunity to, to address and make the changes to, to make things better. Okay, thank you. Next question. Yes. My name is Steve Sloniger from Centerville, Indiana, and I am a farmer and a farm manager throughout this state. And I'm here to publicly recognize these two gentlemen, Brad and Jeff. For the last several years, have done a wonderful job representing agriculture as well as our community. You may recall the whole town of Jacksonburg basically was condemned uh, by the Water Quality Division of DNR incorrectly that we then found out. Uh, there was two houses in Wayne County that basically were uh, instructed to be destroyed, brand new, young families, that was actually not at the time of building in the floodplain. So we saw the problem a couple years ago. These fellows have done a wonderful job. We've spent a couple years on a drainage task force. Passed this year, very, very happy about Senate Bill 140, which provides for safely removing log jams from the rivers, streams throughout the state of Indiana because we have this emerald ash problem, of course. It's huge log jams in our streams today. We were told we had to get in with a chainsaw in the water to remove those by law. So now we don't have those issues. The other issue was basically about farmers building a fence. We had to get a permit. There are people who waited four and five months, farmers, to get a permit from the state of Indiana to build a farm fence. Those things are now revolved, resolved, as well as building a crossing of your normal farm uh, from one field to the other. There was a permit process. So we've had, um, I'm gonna say, good success this year, and I wanna publicly recognize these two gentlemen for about two and a half years of extraordinary work for landowners and farmers in Indiana. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question. Well, I'll just comment on that. I mean, I think, uh, you know, this is an example where we represent this community and we have community members that are concerned about something and bring something to our attention. And, and in reality, uh, you know, a lot of times we're, we're responsive to these big consolidated groups like uh, Indiana Farm Bureau and uh, uh, soybean industry or, you know, whatever, whatever the industry is. And that's all well and fine. But at the end of the day, this was an example to me where it was a really a grassroots effort. And I think, you know, Steve, you really kind of um, you really kind of push the envelope on this thing and just get the get, get us this information and, and the importance of it. And then got a group together from um, multiple counties in in East Central <coughs> Indiana. And I and there was a presence at the state house then as well. You were involved in committee meetings and and actually served on the same task force we served on last year. So to me, it's kind of an example of uh, kind of a community partnership, a grassroots effort that then gets uh, momentum and then gets the backing of uh, uh, the representation then at the State House. So to me, it was really an encouraging thing. Yeah, and, I, and I, I'm glad you mentioned that. I want to make this comment to all of us. It was a, a picture where uh, whether you're a Democrat or Republican didn't make any difference. We were all together in the room and we came up with a, didn't get all the way there. It took us two years to get there, but we, and we didn't get everything we wanted still, but, but we got very close. And so I was thankful that, that the, uh, we got enough along the way that it pleased everybody and still kept some, uh, parts of the DNR in place so they don't lose everything as well. So, uh, uh, it was a way, uh, I guess a perfect picture of how over a two-year period we got where we wanted to be, or at least it, something that was incredibly acceptable. So, okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, yes. I stole the microphone. <laughs> 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 We're all being too nice to each other this morning, so I've got a four or five questions I'd like for the group that, <coughs> that our representatives think about. First of all, is the question of assessments in the state of Indiana. 
And the only person that seems to be looking at property taxes and this issue is Jamie Rittenauer of the candidates that are now running. And we collect about $10 billion a year in property taxes in the state, so I understand. And we're not a low tax state. We're 34th, and in what? Gas tax, we're about fourth. So maybe you'd like to address what you may know about a, what the Republicans are going to be doing in property tax issues, because nobody's talking about it. But my property tax assessment for 2023, it went up 9.1 percent, and that's a little higher than the 1 percent for homesteads. And that's all revolves around assessment. Okay, next item. Uh, the primary rules governing how a citizen can run for office. That was very interesting. Maybe you could talk about a little bit about those rules, if, if you know. This is John Rust, who was, and we have a lady right here, was Tracy Jellison in uh, Richmond that were denied. And I think maybe those rules need to be revisited. Another, act, another interesting thing that happened was the public access calendar counselor <clears throat> was created by Jim Merritt some years ago. Position had no power, but the legislature made this position less powerful. This person can now be fired by the governor for virtually no reason. Prior to this, they were appointed and they could not be relieved. And this person was there to I, what was the word? Transparent government? And they've clamped down on this position, and it had no legislative power to do anything. And then maybe you can tell us how Senate Bill 234, limiting the power of the government, the governor went. And the last thing is, what's going to happen? Is anybody going to be fired for the $1 billion debacle regarding this Medicaid money? So. There, there's a few things for the thank gentleman to talk you. about. Really, and, uh, <laughs> I thought it was one question at a time. It, it was one question at a, uh, per, at a time. So we, yeah. what we'll do is we'll give you an opportunity to address um, the first question, and then we'll follow up with other questions as, we, as time permits. But we want to make sure we have time for other people to ask questions as well. Well, uh, I guess I'll, I'll start, you know, we, because of inflation is the reason why we are where we are with property assessments and why uh, property taxes went up. It's, government didn't create, well, I shouldn't say government didn't create it, but, but the state of Indiana didn't create it. Uh, and so did we give relief? We did last year, and we incrementally gave a little bit again this year. Uh, but uh, when you look at it across the, the, the spectrum, uh, my, my answer is somewhat uh, on both ends of the spectrum. Uh, the concept of the increase if you sold your house today, it would be worth that amount of money, and that can't be taken away from you, essentially. It's worth whatever people will pay for it based on what the market uh, allows and what you'll take for it. Uh, replacing it's a whole other story because it's going to be elevated as well. And so we all, we all are old enough in this room to know that, that it ebbs and flows over time. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm just coming from a 50,000-foot viewpoint uh, with a little uh, view of this. Uh, we've done some things. The question is how much we do and is it temporary and uh, make sure that municipalities still have the capacity to uh, cover all the services that everybody's accustomed to at elevated prices as well. And so uh, I, I, the, kind of the whole answer that I have for you, honestly, uh, we gave some relief uh, specifically to residential owners, uh, but if we do that, then the other pieces of the puzzle with the, the tax caps and the way everything's calculated, another entity then pays a little bit more. And so it's a balancing act for sure. I wish I had a better answer for you on that one, but. <clears throat> you bet. Fact of the matter is, I'll tell you one thing. I'm sorry? I think you're talking about Ryan Mishler. I'm not 100% sure, but he's the the uh, uh, appropriations chairman in the Senate, and he actually had a bill this year that he put out there that uh, would would actually change all of the taxing in the state of Indiana, and that's based on a, a billion dollar surplus that we'll end up with here, 
in the next five years uh, that we, we currently have put at least a billion dollars annually on a, uh, a pension fund for teachers that was pre-96 because it was a pay-as-you-go and it was very short-sighted when it was set up. I think we've talked about it in here before, but a, a billion dollars off the budget annually uh, goes to catch that up so that it's solvent. And so uh, and we've, we've actually added additional dollars of the surpluses we've had over the past few years to try and pay that thing down so we can free up that billion. And part of that was to take a look at the, so he is, his concept this year, he actually had a bill. Uh, we heard it and that was it. Didn't do a lot of research on it, but it was intriguing to me because uh, take that billion dollar surplus and, and put it towards property tax and then where could we bring up the rest of the dollars uh, to be able to come up if we were to eliminate property taxes. What we have to keep in mind is that we have to be competitive with the states around us, and so the revenue is going to come from somewhere. We're fairly high on our sales tax as well compared to other counties, or other states, excuse me. Uh, we're low on our, uh, we're the lowest state in the, in the nation that utilizes income tax uh, for a revenue source. 2.6%, uh, I think we are this year. We, we increased that, or not increased it, but pushed getting that down where it belongs. But then you need to have a conversation about what's a, a tax that uh, uh, everybody participates in, what, what, what's a fair tax uh, across the board. So we're certainly looking at it. Uh, I was, in, again, intrigued when I seen that bill this year that we really would sit down and take a good hard look at our, our system and does it work, does it not work. Ohio, they, they have, a I think they're at 5.5% sales tax, but in counties over in, across the state line, they can uh, charge additional sales tax for revenue for their, their county. And so you know, there are all kinds of different ways uh, to do it, but, but I'm, I would look at something that would be fair. And so we're looking at it, certainly. Uh, and, I, and I guess I'll stop there. Uh, uh, maybe we'll get through the five or not. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about some of the other things you mentioned. So, you know, you talked about the $1 billion shortfall. So um, there have been, you know, a lot of, a lot of these agencies, um, there's turnover in those agencies that you, you as the public are completely unaware of. And, and there was a significant change in position that occurred right before that budget forecast came out. And so I, I believe internally that we have – you know, a, a really strong person in that position. Uh, in addition, I think the governor just appointed a new director of the state budget agency. Uh, so there have been some casualties from that. And, and some of that came from COVID. Some of the policies that were changed in COVID, uh, when they go back and they look at the spend, they see that, wow, there's just been some extraordinary uptick or increase in an area. So. Uh, we've also added some legislation this year that, that adds some transparency in that, some accountability that you wouldn't think you'd need to have, but, uh, you know, kind of spoke to earlier, sometimes uh, circumstances dictate legislation, and, and so there have been changes in that arena. Uh, you referenced Senate Bill 234, which limits the governor's powers, so I think Jeff and I were both on as co-authors and co-sponsors of that bill, and again, as we've done root cause analysis, uh, looked at the ability of a governor to maintain a state of emergency, and that uh, that Senate Bill 234 limits that to number one, a statewide emergency. Uh, a new uh, it limits it to 60 days. At 60 days, it triggers the state legislature to come in and to get involved. And we we looked at every state in the nation. We worked through a. Pacific Legal Foundation that gave us information on this, and some states are part-time legislators, some some states are full-time legislators, some have unicameral house, some have bicameral. We we kind of came up with best policies and came up with a 60-day window that we we as a legislature would be called in in those circumstances. Uh, public access counselor uh, that actually got attached to a bill that came out of uh, JD's uh, district north of us. Um, maintenance of decorum at, at public meetings and uh, you know everything you do has an impact uh, a positive impact on somebody and a negative impact on somebody else and uh, I, I look at what we did is adding accountability to an office that really was placed into a spot where they were functioning without that accountability and we've simply given the governor the ability to um, 
change the direction of that or change the leadership of that agency just pretty much like you can do with any other agency in the building and so to me it was an it's an accountability thing that we've uh helped to create or ensure and I'll, let me follow up on that one jim because uh i had some difficulty with him several years ago in one of the uh really controversial bills that we had in the education committee uh uh we had police presence and because we expected it to get potentially could have gotten out of hand and so we had uh, you know police in the chamber and outside the chamber and and uh, one of the things I said was I'd appreciate if you don't uh, record in this remover pact uh, but we record everything uh, hundred percent of the time and it's available within hours once the uh, committee hearing is over with and uh, that day someone complained to the public access counselor he chided me publicly in the state and the next day came back without without ask and said <clears throat> excuse me i was wrong uh, we could as long as uh, i don't know the reason why i just came back in public he didn't say it publicly it came back to me through our leadership that he uh, was wrong in his assessment on that and so uh, um, there was some question on on his uh, as brad talked about accountability and and uh, and that was part of why I was in support of it because, uh, as as he mentioned, accountability. What what? How do you interpret the law? And if you interpret it inappropriately, what what's the consequence for it? So because he has uh, carte blanche uh, uh, ability to to publicly announce X, Y, or Z. So. I agree with Brad. I, I think it was uh, necessary and, and something that doesn't clip his wings from doing what's right, just holds him accountable for it. Uh, and the last thing I'll talk about is, well, I can for the concept of Jim Rust. Uh, you know, we have in law that if a person uh, votes in primary a couple times, uh, that, that uh, they, if they're jumping from Democrat to Republican or vice versa, uh, that's why that law is in there, so that people don't jump from one side to the other. And and uh, I was upheld by the court system twice now, and so I think uh, it's it's a good piece of legislation, or the concept, not the legislation, the law that exists, I think is is good, so that uh, uh, people are functioning where they say they're functioning, so they're not a wolf in sheep's clothing, essentially. Whether that and so it's up to John Rust uh, in his issue there uh, to look back and, and sometimes there are circumstances that probably fall in those categories that are not that cut and dry uh, and so that that'd be my best answer for you. Well, there's more complicated than that because if you miss voting in a primary, you're you're not eligible, <laughs> and I think you have to have so many signatures so there's. I think that whole issue ought to be revisited. It's been suggested that maybe 80% of Hoosiers would not be eligible if they decide to run public office. And so everybody needs to really read what the rules are, and they were created by Democrats and Republicans a number of years ago. Thank you. Um, I, I I appreciate you addressing the multiple questions, but we, we do need to give our other audience members an opportunity to ask some questions. I saw some hands in the audience here. Hi, I'm Denise Bullock. I'm, I have a question for you, Senator Rods. Yes. So what is your plan to enforce SB 202 and how many tax dollars will be spent in that enforcement? So uh, you want to talk about Senate Bill 202. And, and so I'll tell you what Senate Bill 202 uh, was the first bill that I've ever seen in the General Assembly that came out and tried to help steer a higher education. Uh, in some direction, one way, shape, or form. It was incredibly controversial, and it, it was taken down from the point where it started. I mean, we negotiated it down uh, to where it landed today. And I'm, I'm actually glad for the question because uh, we're sitting in a higher ed institution, so it's good to, to talk about it. So um, I can throw out some statistics of why that bill was created, and I, and I, I will actually. Part, part of the reasons behind it, uh, we're, one of the things that we're looking at is Indiana, we have a low college going rate and trying to look back at some of the reasons why that that is. And so uh, not as anecdotal, but some, some of the key reasons why that piece of legislation was uh, created. 
so we can look at a couple things here. Um, there was a Gallup poll that observed the percentage of Republicans who have confidence in higher education fell 37 points from 2015 to, to 2023, uh, and uh, only 19 percent trust universities. Uh, another one commissioned the state found that 46 percent of politically conservative students in Indiana believe they can only openly express their com opinions compared to 79 percent of uh, the other side of the political spectrum. These are, these are really difficult issues, and so I think we landed in a place, in my opinion, that we waded into this thing about knee deep and, and just took a stance and said, look, Indiana spends $1.8 billion annually in the seven institutions that are state institutions, including uh, IU and Ivy Tech and Vincennes and, and the others. Uh, that, I wouldn't say that was the impetus behind it all, but certainly part of the decision to take a good hard look at what we're doing. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you a couple anecdotal stories as well. Uh, so uh, in the past two years, I had uh, a group of doctors that came from one of the institutions. And not, I shouldn't say a group, to be totally honest. It was one man and another individual and said, you know, uh, in uh, the medical programs or doctoral programs for uh, physicians, uh, we're being steered towards uh, abortion as the only option uh, for, a fa for a mother uh, to, for, for whatever reasons why. That was one of the things that was brought to us. The other interesting thing that happened this year, and I, I won't name the institution, but in the K-12 space we have uh, programs that are taught virtually dual credit programs from maybe the mothership of a college uh, to rural school districts. And a mother came to me from the Fort Wayne area and shared uh, a curriculum and a syllabus that was being taught in a, a government class this, is a, this was not at all part of, let me, let me clarify, this was something totally separate from Senate Bill 202, but gave me the desire to participate or, or support the bill. Uh, we went through the, the curriculum and it was horrible. Uh, it had reference to white people and President Trump and m many other things. And so this, whoever the instructor was, in my opinion, was way out of line. Uh, and so I called the liaison for the institution. They came in and said, you know, this kind of came up with some excuses and, and really was kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, didn't really want to talk about it. And then he, his comment to me was, well, we'll we will just, uh, we have to look at academic freedom. And I said, well, look, if this is the kind of stuff you're going to teach in the K-12 space where kids are there because they're, they're, they have to be there, uh, then I'll, I'll just have a bill and say higher ed institutions won't teach uh, dual credit courses in the K-12 space virtually. It was that bad. So th that was why I participated in this thing, but it took an internal guy uh, that understood the system to come up with this piece of legislation that uh, talks about intellectual and cultural diversity. And I think it's common sense, frankly. Do you need me to repeat the question again? I just explained the bill. I'm glad if I didn't no, answer, I'll tell no, you yes or I no. Was, I was asking your plan for enforcement of the bill. Oh, yeah and what tax dollars will be spent in that enforcement. It's up to the institutions and the Commission on Higher Ed to do the enforcement of it. I wanted to explain the bill to the rest of the folks in the audience, so I appreciate that. But that, that's what the answer is. Uh, Representative Barrett? Well, you know, I follow Jeff's lead on this. I mean, he certainly was passionate about it, and we had a committee on our side that vetted that as well. And. Uh, you know, to the point of the question, a lot of this stuff we do has, I think, some idealistic overtone to it, and that a lot of these things we do, where's the enforcement piece come from? How do you, you know, a lot of it is we're, we're, we're passing legislation and we're setting guidelines, and then, you know, some of that is relying on um, uh the institutions to kind of follow through with with those guidelines and, and then uh, this doesn't happen in a vacuum you know we look at a year from now two years from now five years from now where we are where we are I think I referenced the nursing issue uh, when I opened how you you circle back and you find out where is the where are the issues how can we improve on this how can we uh, how can we uh, 
either pull back or go forward or how can we how can we enforce this uh, do we need to enforce it I think those are things that we'll have to look at as as things kind of unfold over the next several years thank you next question uh, right here Ron at Nyer. Um, my question is like a nice subtle topic gun control <laughs> um, we have a violence gun issue here in the United States, in Indiana as well. Um, the vast majority of uh, people who are polled, including gun owners, support common sense gun control. Um, Indiana does have a red flag law that would remove uh, a gun from somebody who is uh, incapable of it. Um, we, uh, House Bill and now House Enacted Act uh, 1235, uh, both of you voted to prevent Gary from suing gun dealers who are not keeping accurate records of where guns are going and that is a major pipeline from uh, a lot of these guns are turning up in Chicago in violent crimes and Indiana or Indianapolis and around the state. So if we're taking the ability, and you voted to take the ability away from uh, Gary to sue gun dealers, what are you going to do to protect citizens of Indiana and by a, 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 an effect of where the guns are going, uh, citizens of, in, of Illinois from uh, guns as well? I'm not certain uh, uh, what you're talking about when it comes to guns going to, El are you talking about going across the state line to Illinois from yes. Indiana? Yes, a lot of guns are showing, they're being purchased at, a, at gun dealers in Gary and they end up in crimes in Illinois, in Chicago. I, I, I don't know if we, we'll, we'll assume that could be true based on the difference between uh, Indiana, uh, Indiana law and Illinois laws essentially, I think ultimately what you're getting down to, correct? Uh, so, first of all, the issue with what happened in Gary, that lawsuit's been out there forever. Uh, when, I, when I say forever, let's say 10 years. I, I think it was 12 years, honestly, but I'd have to really look back to make sure of that. And, and every, one, every other state that's tried that option uh, lost in a court of law. And uh, essentially, it was, it was, it was a, a very concerning issue for me, only in that we, the state stepped in over a... a uh, area in the state, so it kind of trumped local control in some respects, I'd say. And so that said, uh, I did support the piece of legislation because of the history of where it's at in the United States, as well as how long they've been sitting on it with no opportunity to get anywhere with it. And so it was a local issue that one of the legislators from up there brought to the table, uh, and, and that's why I supported it. Representative Barrett? Yeah, I, I looked at that too as the protection against frivolous lawsuits. I mean, this this process has been going on for years and years and years, and we've seen that um, other municipalities, other, other units of government have this uh, ability to come in and maybe hamstring the industry. We also had language in there that talked about personal identifiable information uh, that, you know, ultimately, you know, Americans have a, a Second Amendment right, a constitutional right to, to bear arms. And, and you know, we've got, we've got laws against uh, using a, a handgun for a crime. We've got laws against mur murder. And the, quite frankly, the, the problem is that there are, uh, there are individuals that don't follow those laws. And I think if you you know, you went to some extreme and came with, up with an idea to outlaw the possession of guns right now that, that you, uh, we talked about enforceability. There's just, uh, there's no, there's absolutely no enforceability and would violate what has been established as a constitutional right. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we are just about out of time for today. Uh, I would like to thank all of the community members uh, for coming out and participating. I'd like to thank Senator Rotz and Representative Barrett for coming out and agreeing to spend some time with us today. Um, please stay tuned for more IU East programming, and um, we'll look forward to seeing, it at, seeing you at our next legislative forum next year. Thank you.